Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today, we will be speaking with Shalza Sharma. Shalza is a visiting lecturer at the University of Westminster in the United Kingdom and a PhD student at the University of Exeter. Shalza is a lawyer by training and her academic research is informed by activist practice and work with women's networks, such as Women Against Sexual Violence and State Repression. Shelza's research and academic interests lie at the intersection of gender and women's rights, legal theory, social movements, and contemporary Indian politics. Shelza is an editor of the Detention Solidarity Network, which is an online space to critically engage with the structures and experiences of detention that constitute the carceral state in India. Shelza, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Connor. Thank you. Thank you for having me today, and thanks for that introduction. It's a pleasure. So first, I was hoping you could give us a little bit of, uh, of background on the Hindutva movement and the rise of the Modi regime up until the present point, uh, especially in the context of the continuing and escalating political and health crises in India. So uh, I was thinking that I'll start from the beginning and try to provide an overview of the founding of the RSS, which is the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, or in English, the National Self-Service Organization. Uh, so if you go back, you know, to pre-independence, uh, colonial India brought forth a kind of churning of ideas about who we are as a people, our history and ideology. And within various strands of thought, there was one which, you know, placed importance on the glorious history of the Hindus. One faction was the All India Hindu Mahasabha or Assembly, which was founded in 1915. And from the very beginning of this you know, organization or assembly of people, you see uh, outright hate for the Muslim population and an argument for the return to a glorious Hindu past. In fact, the very foundation of the RSS, which comes, uh, you know, further from this uh, assembly or the All India Hindu Mahasabha, as it was uh, later called, uh, and RSS's foundation is rooted in communal politics and communal in uh, let me just clarify here in the context of south asia will denote you know uh, construction of religious or ethnic identity which might incite strife between people identified uh, being of dif as being of different communities and uh, you know uh, strife stimulating communal violence means to stimulate uh, uh, tensions between different religious groups in the context of South Asia and uh, in the con context of South Asia, you'll see that as a recurring problem as well. So as I was saying, the, the very foundation of the RSS is actually rooted in communal riots that broke out in the city of Nagpur in Maharashtra in the year 1923. Uh, one of the members of the All India Mahasabha was somebody called Hedgevar, who then founded the RSS in 1925. And his decision was actually based on his spite for um, Gandhi's so-called appease appeasement of the Muslims at that time. The other key figure is in this organization is V.D. Savarkar, whose book uh, you know, which is titled Hindutva, who is a Hindu, is of a great influence to Hedgevar. And um, among other violent narratives, uh, one that Savarkar highlights is that he explicitly advocated the use of, you know, rape of Muslim women as a political tool. Now, these ideas are important because you see the shadows and reflections of these uh, ideas in contemporary politics in India as well, uh, where, uh, you know, uh, BJP cadre or BJP uh, members do not hesitate from um, conducting public uh, tricolor or the Taranga flag marches uh, in cases where, uh, in cases of uh, rape of uh, Muslim women and especially children, uh, you know, girl child, and uh, actually openly supporting rapists as well. So, and leading again to communal strife between different communities of uh, Muslim population and the Hindu majority in various areas. 
and we've seen that repetition in the you know in the uh, in since 2014 after the rise of the modi government as well so going back uh, you know, the RSS also has direct linkages with fascist ideology. And one of its founders, Moonji, is best known actually for his visit to Italy to seek inspiration from uh, Benito Mussolini and their Italian fascist youth organization. And then, you know, upon his return, he collaborates with the other founders for uh, making uh, military tra training compulsory for its volunteers and actually model the RSS on that paramilitary youth organization kind of setup. They, you know, are collectively inspired by na Nazi ideology and Hitler. Uh, in fact, you know, Hit gave our successor uh, Golwalkar was a supporter of the Holocaust, if you go back to his writings. Um, so, you know, what I'm trying, my, my reason for going back to linking or talking about Modi is the fact that, you know, Modi from the young age of eight or nine is a part of this organization, RSS, and then rises to the ranks in the BJP, which is the political wing of the RSS. And together, uh, a few other organizations, they call themselves the Sangh Parivar or the Sangh family. And this broad family of organizations uh, actually, you know, take their ideology from this birthing moment where they Muslims, their idea that, you know, Hindus are always in danger and need protection, uh, their ideas of cultural nationalism are rooted within that moment of founding and have, you know, those have impacts uh, in today's um, contemporary politics. Now, uh, let me just fa fast forward to a moment uh, in 1991 when actually Hindutva politics takes hold on the national scene. And that event is actually the demolition of the Babri Masjid Mosque, uh, which is preceded by the Ram Janmabhumi movement, which is, uh, you know, in English would be the uh, birth of Ram movement. Now, the Bhartiya Janata Party, uh, which, you know, Modi belongs to, or the BJP, uh, was actually formed in 1980 and gained popularity at the back of this movement. Um, their, uh, so the party's argument uh, was that the site where the mosque existed or stood in the city of Ayodhya in Uttar Pradesh um, was actually the site of the birthplace of the Hindu deity Ram. So in order to further, further this movement, you know, consolidate Hindu majority votes, uh, the BJP organized a, a chariot journey or a Rath Yatra starting in the 1990 uh, across the country to reach this site of uh, in Ayodhya. And they would uh, travel up to 300 kilometers uh, a day, rousing Hindu sentiments, giving communal speeches, encouraging uh, militant Hindu elements. And this was, of course, I mean, given the kind of sentiment that they aroused, uh, this was followed by illegal and violent destruction of the Babri Masjid Mosque by goons and members of the Sangh Parivar on 6 December 1992. And in fact, you know, again, coming to the contemporary moment, uh, under this government's regime, the uh, you know, the judgment on this case, the Supreme Court finally actually acquitted all the BJP leaders who were accused um, uh, for the violence on that day. And uh, so at that time, this uh, actually led to a great electoral success for the BJP. And this is the moment when the RSS ideas of cultural nationalism actually gain ground in Indian psyche. Um, the if, shadow... I may, if I may ask you a question here, um, in your in your view, were there any uh, important developments or dimensions of the situation at that time in the early 1990s that set the stage for the BJP and RSS ideas gaining such ground to become possible? 
Mm -hmm. So I think what is also happening in terms of transformation uh, at the Indian scene is the, you know, liberalization uh, politics, which is taking place, the opening up of the financial markets, um, the taking off uh, loan from IMF, World Bank, the structural adjustment programs, which are coming in, the fusion of the idea of, you know, what is now known as the uh, Mandir, the temple, which I just spoke about, the market which is the financialization and liberalization politics at that time, and Mandal, which is about the reservation or the caste reservation politics, is taking uh, root within Indian politics. So, uh, yes, in terms of setting ground, this is a key moment of transformation other than just, uh, you know, cultural nationalism, which takes hold. The shadows of this moment in uh, 1991, 92 uh, are actually, you know, you can see continued impact of this movement with the Gujarat riots in 2002, which again, Narendra Modi as the CM of Gujarat overseas, uh, the lynchings of Muslims in India after Modi came to power in 2014, um, and the fact that the promise of this you know, Ram Temple actually held sway uh, even during recent elections. In terms of, you know, electoral politics, what has happened since 2014 is a steady erosion of local or state parties by the dominant BJP, uh, uh, part, dominant BJP party and uh, a party which actually has huge financial and unprecedented organizational capacities um, to actually sway uh, electoral results in its favor. This has been coupled by policies such as, you know, uh, one nation, one tax, which is the goods and services tax. Uh, these kinds of measures are actually moving towards, in my opinion, a consolidation of power at the center. And these moves have to be seen in connection with complete erosion of political and civil rights of the citizens by the Sangh Parivar, um, a, a, you know, a a organization for whom the constitution of India actually holds no legitimacy. It is a complete hollowing out of institutions. Uh, we've seen that through, you know, complete takeover of the media, the judiciary, uh, government institutions, universities, schools, you know, things like changing of syllabi, changing of um, history textbooks, uh, complete uh, dismantling of university, uh, you know, student councils or any kind of political dissent from any quarter uh, of the country that has been completely dismantled, uh, you know, since 2014. And this actually has given rise to, uh, you know, coupled with, as I said, the consolidation of power uh, at the center has brought us to this moment, I think, during COVID crisis, um, where we are actually very far, far away from any kind of socialist policy on health, uh, where the grand spectacle of electoral politics for the Modi government holds more prominence over, you know, mass cremations, as we saw in Delhi. And there are confused policy decisions on the COVID crisis leading to abandonment by the center. And uh, states are flailing to deal with the crisis. Uh, they are left without legitimacy on the political scene. They're left without resources and they're left without aid. And I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the global dimensions of the situation in India and the lead up to the present moment. As you mentioned, uh, a dominant or a key factor uh, in that initial period uh, in the early 1990s was liberalization, the role of the IMF and the World Bank and so on. And I'm wondering uh, if you could say a little bit more about from that period up until 2014, the BJP coming to power, uh, that this takes place in the context of the global rise of the far right. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the economic and geopolitical uh, dimensions to that situation and the, the interests of international, particularly Western countries? Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, we've seen the commonalities between the far right and they've been easy to draw, whether Bolsonaro, Trump, uh, Erdogan, Modi, and they've all been sort of instrumental in dismantling um, human rights of vulnerable populations. 
uh, they hold particular ideas about marginalized po populations and they're not actually afraid to you know articulate them in public uh, they have huge uh, supporters in terms of you know troll armies um, that they that do their bidding uh, they spread, you know, misinformation, fake news, propaganda with complete impunity, uh, you know, from corporations uh, such as Facebook and Twitter. Um, and, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, scandals such as Cambridge uh, Analytica and all of that. So uh, these these parties and, and this, you know, the far right um, belong uh, they share xenophobic nationalist traits, um, you know, a tendency towards authoritarianism and definitely an anti-elite uh, message. Um, one thing that I think this, uh, what, what this means in terms of international scale is that it has led to a mainstreaming and normalization of the hate narrative. So I see them as a global phenomena, and some scholars have actually said that uh, they may not be the global rise of the far right is a global phenomena, but in the sense uh, as a global force, uh, in the they are uh, concentrated on extreme nationalism, uh, and they have championed national sovereignty. Um, and so there is some kind of confusion between these narratives as well. So, for instance, when Modi goes to uh, the U.S. and, you know, puts up this howdy Modi, uh, there's a huge welcoming uh, by him, by Trump uh, uh, there. There is a confusion with respect to their alignment of the vision, right? Because uh, on one hand, Trump does not... Um, uh, you know, hesitate from showing his support for uh, uh, Pakistan. And on the other, when Modi goes there, on the other hand, when Modi goes uh, for uh, this roadshow, he uh, says that Trump and Modi uh, are together in their vision against uh, global terrorism. Um, and, you know, one thing that is actually important on the international scale to talk about when uh, talking about Modi is his... Um, complete uh, transformation of the diaspora diplomacy uh, when it comes to India. And before Modi and actually before BJP, when the Congress, uh, you know, for many years has been in power, they don't look at the diaspora as, uh, you know, as a unit which can help with uh, in any way with politics or affect politics uh, within the Indian territory. But this completely is transformed when it comes to Modi. He is actually looking at the Indian diaspora as um, as people who, who are the shining examples of rising India. He's looking at them as people who will contribute to, you know, uh, funds who will contribute to the name and fame of the uh, Indian democracy, as opposed to earlier when uh, their leaving India was more seen as a brain drain, brain drain uh, from India as well. So it's a complete transformation of the economic links as well between the diaspora and uh, the Indian population. So um, and there are direct links with there that you can make within, um, you know, RSS. Uh, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad, which is again a part of the um, uh, Sangh Parivar and its local chapters in both UK and uh, the US who support monetarily and politically right-wing candidates in elections in the US or the UK. So those links are not actually uh, very difficult to make. Those links are visible in terms of how they fuel, fuel each other's right wing, um, you know, hate against, uh, uh, you know, migrants, hate against a certain kind of idea of the working class uh, as well. So and uh, get, you know, consolidate on the basis of religion, ideas of community, ideas of um, uh, caste superiority also, which is important in the context of India. So I think this, uh, this, you know, is important to think about when thinking about Modi in the context of global developments. Hmm. To to come back a, a little bit to to this point, um, you were discussing about the the global far right as a as a, a the the rise of the far right as a global phenomenon or not. You write to mm -hmm. note, I think, uh, initially first that there is a, a certain tension or a certain mm -hmm. 
apparent contradiction between the fact that there's a, a nationalist, a series of nationalist movements across the globe. Mm -hmm. There's um, there's a phrase I believe that is used by Yanis Varoufakis, the former mm -hmm. finance minister, who describes it as a nationalist international. I think mm -hmm. I'm sure a bit of that that paradox. Yeah. Um, and and but it, but it's important I think that there uh, we do see at least cases of uh, working together and sharing knowledge and information, especially between the United mm -hmm. States or North American and European far right movements. Mm -hmm. I mean Steve Bannon and these types. Um, but but the the point I wanted to to make as well uh, in relation to uh, the significance of whether or not they have a, a commonality between them is the shared conditions from which they emerge. And I think that this connects back to the point that you were making before about the, the role of the IMF liberalization and so on, and the uh, devastation that that has uh, left from ecological to economic dispossession and economic precarity across the globe in all of these places. Mm -hmm. sowing the kind of conditions needed for such a movement to arise. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And um, the, the, you know, the politics of the structural adjustment programs and the kind of uh, destruction, as you said, on the economies, the ideas of dev development, where, which have been propagated in the global south are, you know, uh, are very clear for all of us to see the complete uh, erosion of political and civil rights of, uh, uh, you know, people who have, who should have claims over indigenous land, the Adivasis, the Dalits, um, is, is, something, uh, you know, extreme corporatization, uh, violence by the state in the areas which are resource rich is, you know, uh, completely dependent on the sort of global north's idea of what development should look like. And that has continued through these, um, you know, sort of good governance policies, which have aligned very well with the BJP's idea of, um, you know, cultural nationalism, nationalism, which is the Ram Rajya or the ruling of the Lord Ram, uh, the idea of good governance in the first, uh, you know, innings of the BJP government and bringing in the idea of, as I said, um, this welfare, um, oh, sorry, the idea of development uh, for the people uh, that has completely destroyed our own indigenous understandings of development. So yes, they go hand in hand in terms of thinking about uh, when we think about the conditions that have been created in within these economies to actually uh, give rise to this narrative. Mm. And, and you mentioned uh, earlier the connection between the uh, form, the, the origins of the RSS and mm -hmm. the, the development of these uh, movements based on the construction of homogenous identities or ethnicities mm -hmm. and the impact that colonialism uh, had on, on this developments in the early 20th century. And, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering, it, or it, it seems to me that it could be that this uh, imposition of this kind of understanding of development and this economic model is, mm -hmm. is of a similar uh, nature that it comes as imposed from global economic structure centered in the West. Mm, yeah, I agree. Mm. And I mean, that is why, I mean, going back to the point about what, uh, you know, Varoufakis says, you actually see the examples of that with, you know, campaigns in India about uh, make in India, uh, the, the, you know, and in America about make uh, America great again. Um, so those kinds of things are reflected within economic policies as well, for sure. But there is a, um, I would say those, at least in the case of India, those remain at propaganda level um, in okay. the sense that uh, while there is a complete stress and the alignment of, uh, you know, uh, local elite with the BJP government, uh, there is, 
very justifiably in terms of you know predicting the trends of how the right wing government operates a complete erosion of uh, labor rights a complete erosion of anything that looks uh, democratic uh, a complete erosion of uh, knowledge centers that have you know helped to serve uh, at least you know until today some uh, uh, democratization within society a complete uh, dismantling of public st structures of health public structures of social security benefits um so while that on the propaganda level that kind of idea of you know uh, we are self reliant we are for good governance we are going to make in india produce in india exist uh but as we know what happens on ground is you know extension of the work day from 8 hours to 12 hours and complete um uh, as i said uh, complete uh, destruction of labor rights for uh, the working class absolutely um next following on from this I, I would like to ask you about the conditions of state violence in india um specifically with the rise uh, as we've been discussing in relation to the sowing of divisions with the rise of the BJP, uh, as well as, as you mentioned briefly, the issue of anti-terror legislation in India mm -hmm. and the issue of political prisoners. So I'm actually, uh, I thought about this uh, question and I uh, think I'm going to answer this by talking about a series of events that took place in Delhi in February 2020, uh, which were the pogroms against Muslims in East Delhi. Uh, and to talk about that, let me just briefly tell you a little bit about the anti-CA uh, movement that began in December 2019. So the Citizenship Amendment Act or the CAA, um, you know, proposes to amend the Indian Citizenship Act to accept illegal uh, migrants who are Hindus, Sikh, Jain, Parsi, uh, Buddhist uh, and Christian from Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan who entered India before 2014 following religious uh, persecutions. The act does not mention Muslims and other communities who may have fled from the same or other neighboring countries. So it, you know, explicitly explicitly excludes um, you know refuge, refugees from sri lanka and uh, tamils in india rohingyas from myanmar tibetan refugees uh, they're not at all uh, mentioned or the, the act does not uh, cover them and then the other act or the legislation which was uh, you know during the uh, movement opposed was the national registration of citizens uh, act which you know, wanted an official record of all legal citizens of India. Um, and so within that act, individuals would need to provide a prescribed set of documents before a specified cutoff date to be included in the register. Uh, the amendment was widely criticized as discriminating on the basis of re religion, particularly for excluding Muslims. Uh, there were concerns that all citizens would be affected by this, you know, huge bureaucratic exercise of the register, um, where they would have to actually prove their citizenship for including uh, for inclusion in the registry. And so, you know, uh, against both these uh, legislations, the anti-CAA protests were, you know, peaceful protests against. Uh, across the country, mostly led by Muslim women in various places, including the very famous now Shaheen Bagh in Delhi. Uh, and so the protesters, you know, emphatically raised their voices against authoritarianism and the police crackdown in universities at that time in December 2019. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that actually uh, the government in two universities sent in armies to curb protests by students. So as a reaction to what was happening at that time, the anti-CAA movement kind of flared up. Um, you know, they, they went for about 60 days. The movement was extremely uh, supported in India and across the uh, country by many students and people from all kinds of uh, background. Uh, but in February, violence broke out in East Delhi when some people alleging to you know support the caa held a demonstration disrupting the peaceful anti-caa protests and in the strife leading up to this violence uh, more than 50 people died hundreds 
were unfortunately injured and there was huge loss of life property and livelihood for the muslim families living in these areas um, news reports and testimonies confirmed police complicity complicity uh, many areas were ransacked by right wing bjp goons uh, who massacred people while you know chanting their war cry which is jai shri ram or hail lord ram and using this violence as an excuse the government in uttar pradesh in the north of india persecuted many muslim families and dissenters across the state firing indiscriminately into crowds beating muslim by standards uh, by standards um, raiding and looting muslim homes uh, detaining and physically abusing muslim children in detention and uh, also imprisoning muslim lawyers and activists now this moment i think uh, you know that happened not so uh, long ago is important because i think it would be a mistake to think that this was an isolated incident there was a huge media um, you know as i said earlier there's a full takeover of the media houses by the right wing government also so there was a huge media uh, spin of the narrative where this was only looked at as a violent incident with you know one party being violent and uh, complete demonizing of the muslims in this case and um, so to think that this was an isolated incident and this was not uh, pogroms specifically designed against the muslim population would be wrong uh, and to you know go back to think again uh, about what happened in gujarat riots in 2002 and the state violence and repression since 2015 these pogroms are a you know continuation of the bjp rss agenda of uh, brahmanical uh, hindu fascism and so you know all of this is happening uh, again to uh, you know think about since 2014 against the you know this is happening um, against the backdrop of repeated action um, against activists students lawyers under under colonial sedition laws or anti terror laws uh, whose roots can be you know traced to the colonial era the national investigation agency in india has targeted activists lawyers poets students uh, all individuals collectives um, you know civil and democratic rights organizations you know something as prominent as the amnesty international had to close their office in india uh, so anybody who has raised their uh, voice against state violence and erosion of human rights has been completely vilified um and this vilification i mean it's important to look at it in terms of the kind of discourse that has been created right uh, anybody who speaks up or questions the government is labeled as anti national it is uh, leading to criminalizing of dissent of all shades whether you know you call it very radical to just questioning why the government has stopped collecting data on unemployment so anything which and to ask a question um, um, yeah. briefly sorry is uh, is that criminalization that you were speaking about now is anti terror legislation a primary tool that's used to execute mm -hmm. it okay mm -hmm. yeah so the the unlawful activities prevention act or the uapa and the sedition laws uh, are something that are used and this is not uh, the thing is that this is not particular to this government but the complete acceleration the complete criminalization or the as, and i think again going back to looking at uh, the kind of discourse which has been created around uh, who gets to question the government and uh, what gets to be labeled as dissent is important but we should remember that this is a tool which has been continuously post uh, be, been used by post colonial india to curb any form of dissent so there's actually been uh, not been any kind of transformation when we look at in terms of the use of these laws whether it was by the colonial government to suppress dissent or it whether it has been by the congress uh, in previous eras or by this government now but definitely uh, there is you know coupled with the complete erosion of you know political rights a belief in the constitution uh, as i said earlier a complete hollowing out of all kinds of institution it's it's much more dangerous now following on from from this point i wanted to ask about the history of resistance 
in India. Um, so now, of course, we are seeing a, a large farmers' protests against the recently proposed agriculture laws. Mm -hmm. um, and you also mentioned the NDCA movement as well. Can you situate these developments in the context of the broader uh, history of resistance recently in India, as you mentioned with regards to this criminalization and so on? Yeah, sure. Um, so it is true that India has, you know, continuously post before and post 1947 after its independence, uh, seen a strong legacy of resistance movement which has played out across different regions of the country and almost every region has uh, its own history of people's struggles to uh, you know kind of claim uh, but with the coming of the Modi government in 2014 and their moves to as I said hollow out whatever remains of institutions of democracy free speech and dissent uh, actually spread a web of fear among among many members of society, um, you know, and the stronghold, as I said also earlier, by uh, the financial, the kind of financial political power that the diaspora seemed to supply also um, helped to, you know, maintain, as we've all, all you know, in international media, uh, projected the image of India being this, you know, largest democracy and the you know, uh, loving yoga doing kind of uh, people as well. So uh, that kind of um, entrenched his his coming to power actually entrenched a kind of fear uh, in in many lawyers, students, activists, and as I said, civil and democratic rights organization and created a chilling effect uh, because anybody who spoke up would be charged under these anti-terror laws. Um, but there were smaller acts of resistance which kept continuing and even before the anti-ca which i spoke about uh, a little earlier there was something known as the uh, Pathalgadi movement which literally means carving the stone in 2017-18 uh, and this is important because uh, a move this was a movement spread out um, you know across uh, central India in the states of Jharkhand, uh, Chhattisgarh and Orissa uh, where Adivasis actually uh, established green stone slabs with constitutional provisions written in white lettering. Now, this, you know, very ordinary act actually uh, strengthened the belief in the Indian constitution and did not sit well with the current government with, you know, with the BJP RSS completely, um, you know, not uh, following the constitution at all. So in Jharkhand, you know, following these acts by different villages and Adivasis, uh, close to a thousand people were booked under sedition. And there was a, you know, round the clock presence of paramilitary troops in many districts uh, at that time. Now, the anti-CA protests and the farmers protests have actually, because they've been on such a large scale and there is the support of this kind of social media phenomena with it, uh, they have broken up a kind of silence that had existed, you know, since Modi's ascent in 2014. Um, they, in my opinion, they've, you know, kind of um, managed to demonstrate on a national scale that huge public mobilizations are actually possible against this regime. Um, they are, of course, met by equal repression, hostility, and criminalization by the state. Um, and now you, you know, have the threat of COVID as well. So, but I think they have been majorly instrumental in kind of um, dismantling or shattering the image of Modi as this, you know, person who's going to come and clean India, Modi, who is, you know, very popular leader in uh, politics in India. You know, Modi came to power actually saying that uh, it is a Modi leher or a Modi wave. It's ironic to now think of, you know, those words with COVID waves and Modi waves. So it's, I mean, his waves have been just as uh, destructive, I suppose, for all uh, people as well in India. So, um, no, so for me, I think the, the kind of dissent we've seen and the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the kind of 
uh, huge mobilization, uh, whether again uh, locally uh, where it is happening and outside of India is, is kind of an indication of the fact that these kinds of public mobilizations are not, uh, we are not seeing the last of it. They are going to continue. This kind of, uh, there is a kind of anger, um, you know, there is an unsettled feeling about Modi uh, and the BJP and the RSS, which the people are not accepting. And slowly, this is coming to you know surface in various forms. And one of this is, of course, the farmers movement, uh, which was, um, if I can just give it a little background, there were, um, you know, this was leveled against three laws that the Modi government uh, proposed, which, you know, uh, was termed by the farmers unions as the black laws. So uh, these laws, so there was the Farmers Produce Trade and Commerce Promotion and Facilitation Act, the Farmers Empowerment, uh, ironically named Empowerment and uh, Protection Agreement on Price Assurance and Farm Services uh, Act and the Essential Commodities Amendment uh, Act of 2000. So these laws uh, propose to actually allow the farmers to sell their uh, produce outside the you know guaranteed markets allow them to sell their produce to agro businesses at a predetermined price and ease the control over the production uh, and sale of agricultural produce this uh, move was seen as, you know, an aggressive or is still seen as an aggressive privatization of the farming sector. Uh, it, it, it's seen as, you know, something that will lead to complete destruction of the uh, government guaranteed price or which is known as the minimum support price model for the distressed farmers. Uh, it'll lead to complete erosion of the bargaining power of farmers with, you know, who have small land holdings um, and, you know, their levels of indebtedness, uh, given the kind of policies that exist, um, is extremely high. So, you know, and this is something which is a direct attack on a uh, sector which is, you know, provides which employs almost 60% of the population. And um, so in the middle of the last year, we, uh, the farmers unions in Punjab, uh, you know, since then they have been protesting against these black laws. In November 2020, farmers unions supported by huge public gathering of protesting farmers from Punjab and uh, the neighboring state of Haryana uh, marched with their, you know, uh, you know, very uh, their tractors, trolleys, and food provisions towards Delhi to ask for the withdrawal of these laws. Uh, they were, of course, met with, uh, you know, batons, tear gas, and repression from the state forces uh, before they could even make their way to Delhi. And, uh, you know, the people and farmers unions uh, in, in what, you know, the kind of developments that took place uh, on ground decided to surround Delhi border from different directions and hold and um, you know indefinite sit in protest and so if you were to visit one of these uh, sites you'd see that uh, they have now since December been converted into settlements of farmers from across the country, students, women, children, uh, participating in unprecedented numbers. And uh, by themselves, they're no less than carnivals with, you know, political speeches and uh, uh, all kinds of food being distributed, all kinds of, you know, cultural activities happening. And, uh, you know, the, the, you know, farmers protest has its own, you know, different uh, newspapers to counter the whole media narrative as well. So, it's been a fantastic uh, sort of, uh, I think, assertion of political rights by people who think that they have been wronged by the state. Mm. And thank you for, for providing that background. And I think the, uh, as you described, the privatization of the agriculture sector in India, the progressive privatization, connects back again to what we were discussing regarding the IMF and international or global, mm -hmm. say, economic neocolonialism. And, and I think that to me, this is the, uh, the strongest argument for the need for an internationalism of people's mm -hmm. existence, that the enemy that we face operates in a global scope, and we must do the same. Yeah, I agree. Um, and it's, 
it's and the kind of i think the the language of resistance the kind of um uh you know movements that are put forth against this you know common enemy are all beautiful in their own way and they they have to um yeah you're right they this is one strong argument in terms of the internationalism that is required uh for us on a large scale to get together and fight this uh, common enemy um yeah mm. And I think this is a, a good segue into the, the final question I wanted to ask you about, which is uh, about self-determination. Now, I will say briefly, our work as Peace in Kurdistan is inspired by the Kurdish freedom movement and their attempts to reimagine and redefine self-determination beyond the right of a people to an independent state as an ethnicity. Uh, specifically, the, the project of democratic confederalism uh, is based on the principle of self of social self-organization in every sphere in a coordinated manner and the understanding of self-determination as the capacity of a people to collectively determine their shared fate or collectively control the organization and development of a society, as I'm sure you know. So I would like to ask you what you personally think about the democratic confederalism project um, and your thoughts about the possibilities for how it could apply or be these principles be picked up in the context of current struggles in India. Mm -hmm. I think um, one of the things that Ochalan said when talking about, uh, you know, democratic confederalism was that uh, his idea of autonomy and how it should be understood. So for him, every community, as he says, and I'm quoting him here, um, every community, ethnicity, culture, religious group, intellectual movement, economic unit can autonomously organize itself and express itself as a political uh, entity. This is how autonomy should be understood. And for us in India right now, this is, you know, an urgent moment to be able to express ourselves in these many ways for us to, you know, get together and show up against, you know, BJP RSS idea of this homogeneous Hindu identity um, that they are trying to impose on us violently since, you know, they have uh, since their uh, coming into power and before. So for us to understand this idea about autonomy that o Ochalan is proposing is something which is very important, very needed in every sphere of life, whether it is, you know, thinking about what even, you know, what community looks like uh, looks like for us the assertion by the anti ca movement to say that you know you cannot determine our citizenship status for us we are going to resist you cannot attack our universities you cannot take away our uh, you know systems of knowledge from us so uh, i think to be able to understand that idea of autonomy is extremely important and central, as Ochalan says, to understanding the idea of democratic and federalism. And I think with that, it is always important to remember uh, that resistance in any form is beautiful because, you know, it shows us different possibilities of modes of being in the world to uh, it helps us reimagine and reconstitute relations uh, under, uh, you know, sometimes extremely stifling conditions of state oppression. Uh, so, so to be able to even, you know, um, articulate our ideas of what a different imagined world should look like is an important way towards thinking about how we want uh, self-preservation, how we want self-determination in every sphere to uh, also look like for us and the, for people uh, around us. Um, the other thing I think that is very important in the way that uh, Ochalan also articulates is, uh, you know, preservation of internal autonomy that against state oppression, uh, a people always know what, you know, their autonomy is coming from, their histories, their, you know, in, in the context of India, I see that as a preservation whenever state oppression is at its height, a preservation of uh, our own ideas of what struggle should look like, our own ideas of who our local heroes of what our past has looked like, looked like in terms of, you know, struggle, struggles 
against state oppression. So even, you know, the farmers struggle going back to, you know, pre-independence movements like the Gadar movement and taking their inspiration from uh, them and their heroes, their, um, you know, struggles even in the present day is a great you know wait for us and an inspiring way for us to think about uh, preservation of internal autonomy and um, you know an inspiration when we are you know theoretically as academics stuck thinking about how to resist fascism is that actually when it comes to uh, people on the ground they know who to actually look to. They don't have to go find them in the books that have been written. They have an internal understanding of uh, who their heroes are, that they are not going to you know, face any kind of oppression when it comes to um, uh, their own people. So I think those are beautiful moments to account for in all kinds of histories of struggle. And finally, I want to say something about what you know, Ochalan says about uh, gender and women and as exploited uh, nation, because even with the kind of resistance movements that are going on, there is, I think, on ground a long way to go in terms of thinking about, you know, women's em emancipation, unfortunately. And so his, uh, for me, the first time when I read Ochalan and his ideas about, um, you know, women being central to any kind of resistance, uh, his articulation of women as exploited nation and then applying that to thinking about ca even caste in India, uh, thinking about gender in India, thinking about, you know, marginalized populations in India is something which I think is extremely center and something which would be extremely useful for uh, resistance movements to also think about how to, you know, uh, when talking about internal autonomy and preservation of that, uh, how to uh, include women, include Dalits, include Adivasis, include Muslims within that fight as well of, uh, you know, finding that autonomy, I think. And so, yeah. Beautifully put, thank you. We are yeah. now, I think, running out of time, but uh, are there any final thoughts you would like to leave us with in closing? Um, no, I think this has been, I mean, in terms of final thought, it has been a good uh, conversation in terms of thinking about, um, actually, when I was thinking about, uh, you know, what has happened since 2014, in terms of uh, what the Modi regime has set out to accomplish and has done, there, there's a huge list of events, which unfortunately, in the time of the interview, we've had to leave out such as the, you know, uh, revocation of Article 370 and talking about Kashmir and population, the, um, you know, complete, uh, you know, exercises such as uh, demonetization, which again were a blow for the working class population of the country. But yeah, those series of events and then coming to now um, is, is a, as I said earlier, these moments such as the anti-CAA and the farmers protest have fortunately shown us the way in terms of, well, this is this government, even with their repressive policies, is not going to, you know, uh, you know, have its control without any kind of resistance movements in this country. So that is, suppose I suppose, the silver lining. Uh, and it, you know, the interview made me think about that. But yeah, uh, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Thank you very much for speaking. It was a great pleasure and very insightful. Thanks, Pana.